And joining us now in studio, Larry Weinstein, the director, Alexina Louie, the composer, and Dan Rudikan, the writer of Mulrooney, the opera. Welcome, gang. <laughs> Thank you for having us. I saw your piece this afternoon. I watched it. I thought it was great. Um, Good. And let's show a little clip. Just before we start talking, we'll show a little clip and then we'll get into it. Roll tape, please, Michael. Prime Minister and Mrs. Mulroney, I'd like you to meet the most powerful individual in America and the free world. And her husband, Ronald Reagan. It's always an honor to be here in Kansas. And shortly thereafter, they were singing When Irish Eyes Are Smiling. <laughs> Larry, where did this idea come from? There were not protests in the streets demanding an opera on Mr. Mulroney's life, so? Well, I, I mean, Mulroney is an opera. I mean, everything about Mulroney is an opera. We, we had made, uh, this is actually our 10th opera we've made together. The, the, other, the other nine are, are short operas between four and six minutes. And we had made these for, for various broadcasters, and, um, and, and they had sold around the world. And, and one day we were having a discussion about what would be a great subject for a full-length opera. And uh, Ryan Mulroney's name came up. Well, <laughs> you know, we come from we have this kind of political comic tradition in Canada. Mm. And um, around the time we we're talking about this, which this was over five years ago, actually, then that, that wonderful Peter C. Newman book came out uh, about Mr. Mulroney. Secret tapes. Secret tapes. And we started to read that, and we um, were having discussions at one of the broadcasters. And uh, yeah, we came up with this idea. I actually became, I actually thought it was the world's worst idea when I first heard about it. Because operas are kind of expensive to, to create original operas. These two are, are quite expensive. And, um, and we. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, but then I, I started reading these, these things and, and the other writings about Brian Mulroney. Eventually, we started reading Mulroney's own autobiography, and there was just so much rich material there. Well, in terms of material, I'm, I'm guessing the most, let's put it this way, you could argue over the last 50 years that, that Brian Mulroney and Pierre Trudeau were the most influential prime ministers we had, yes. consequential. So how come you did it about Mulroney instead of about Trudeau? Yeah. <laughs> Tr Trudeau That's was, the most succinct on. answer to any question I've ever asked. No, it's a good yeah. point. No, I actually thought Trudeau would be better. I thought, you know, there's more, but there'd been a Trudeau movie. It was right. maybe, That's it true. was kind of harder true. to sell. And I, no, I thought Trudeau, and actually said somebody out there is working on a Trudeau opera too. So there's, it, they're, they're so, That's yeah, they're, they're, oh. those, uh, those wheels are turning. Okay. So you did the music. What, yes. what, 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 what is it about Mr. Mulroney's life or character that made you think, there's some wonderful material for an opera here. Well, I mean, given Bay Como, let's look at his childhood in Bay Como. Uh, it's a pastoral scene, and he's looking back at his life as a little boy and, you know, this you know, idyllic place. So I get to write a Bay Como folk song. And when people see that section in the movie, they actually think it's a real Bay Como folk song, but, but it's not. It's not. And also, you know, he thought a lot about himself. I mean, and still today, he still thinks a lot about himself. So every time he spoke to the masses, I got to, to write him fanfares. He sings in a fanfare-ish kind of genre. So it, it was fun. It was but you're fun. actually, uh, this is not the right word, because I'm not in your business, so you'll tell me what it is. <laughs> you're kind of riffing off some of the classic operas of all time, though, right? What? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, put it that I way? Th I thought some of that sounded familiar. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what did you do that you didn't tell us about? Yeah, I think she got paid too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can imagine what our production meetings were like, right? Yes, I, I think mean, I can now. screaming hilarity. Um, no, uh, I love the operatic canon. And somehow, as I was writing to these ridiculous words, uh, ri not ridiculous, brilliantly ridiculous words. Good save. Yes. <laughs> It, there may be other work that we must do together, so I have to be kind to him. Um, no, th that one just sort of fell into these lovely pieces of the canon that I love. And it's a, it's, it's a respect, it's a, an, an homage to the music that I love. Well, since you three are apparently so good together, I'm trying to figure out who the next one's going to be about. So if you have a choice between <laughs> Berlusconi, Clinton, or Trump, who gets the next opera? <laughs> 
Wow, that's good. Uh, that's a, that's an interesting trio. Can't well, go wrong. <laughs> I thought, so we're, uh, we're going uh, sex yeah. uh, there. So <laughs> oh, all right. yes. come on, Berlusconi. I thought so. Okay. I, I think so. Oh, wait, can you imagine the bunga bunga scenes? Come on, this is going to be great. <laughs> well, I wrote my first, you know, bump and grind ever, ever for in this Mulroney opera. Uh -huh. He gave me a bump and grind to write. Dan, maybe we could uh, set it. Uh, I think we could because he's about to be pushed out of Italy, and he'll, mm. they'll probably give him his own little island or something. Right. We can call it Berlusconi Island. <laughs> See, and those are the puns. I find we go every day. And off to the Sorry, races we go. <laughs> Uh, I, I wanted to protest about something that you said, though. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being serious now about comedy. Um, Dan is is a comic writer and comedian, and 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 he um, and you asked about Mulroney versus Trudeau as an mm -hmm. opera subject, and I, I personally think that that the Trudeau opera would be something a bit more serious. I think it'd be hard to poke fun at him. I think that there's something about Brian Mulroney and his rise and fall, his 211 seat majority decimating mm. to the post Mulroney two seats and and the, that Shakespearean fall and, and some of the things that he did and, and his own ego at times. And, and uh, I, I think that that sort of pokes towards, that, that points towards comedy more than the aloofness of, of Trudeau. Great. Entire, because I don't know why we're into this debate, but, uh, but Mulroney uh, did have the rug pulled out from under him. Trudeau has sort of, you know, rose above things even through the end, and like he, uh, and uh, Mulroney's more of a more of a tragic figure, more hmm. more. Uh, yeah, well, okay, yeah. but I, I think that that excuse us because um, <laughs> we, we haven't been together for a while. You guys want this out? I'll just sit here. Just, uh, one more point. <laughs> I, I I think that it. I think it's easier to make, say, a, a comic opera about, say, Britney Spears than it is Lou Reed. And I think that Trudeau was the Lou Reed of our prime ministers, and, <laughs> and in a way, Mulroney is a little well, Britney I'll Spears. I'll certainly give you Lou Reed. Well, <laughs> want, wanting to be loved, wanting to be, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, that's the end of my point. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, let me try this. I, um, you guys are obviously not small C conservatives. We can say that, right? That's right. So, you know, was part of the motivation in doing this piece on Mulroney, in which he, you know, a lot of his flaws are satirically splayed before the camera. Right. I mean, is there a little bit of uh, political and cultural revenge going on here? Uh, um, not on my part. <laughs> really? No, no. I, I actually no. That, that was actually part of why why I kind of was was reluctant at first. I'm, I'm not. I haven't been a political satirist. I've been pretty sort of apolitical. That's and and that's something in an area I've sort of uh, strayed away from because. You get into it, and and uh, my 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 ignorance of politics is revealed. Like I've, I've I've tried to do it over the years, and it's and it's not a comfortable fit for me. So it's uh, uh, the political thing was not my first motivation. So like finding a way in was kind of tough for me. Uh, Larry, how about you? Well, I, I'm not overly political. I, I've I've made films with uh, uh, all my films have been music films, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, some of them have political themes. But the leaders are a bit more extreme than our Canadian leaders' films with Hitler and Mussolini mm -hmm. and Stalin. Um, that would be and, and you know a bit more extreme, uh, a bit more extreme than our leaders. Also more interesting filmically, I think, than a lot of our leaders. But um, no, I, I it wasn't really. Like that, it was just like here's a, a man who's who's a, who's a great Canadian who has all this kind of baggage and and could could be an interesting subject. It's and and we we said we've said that that in the process of of doing this film and researching, we read did a lot of reading, sort of gaining some kind of admiration and respect for a lot of his accomplishments mm -hmm. or or and his will and the things that he wanted to bring in and and and. And honestly, I think the portrayal, though you might think it's edgy or something, there's a certain strange affection there, too. I think our Mulroney has a certain attractiveness about him. Was it your job, Alexina, to somehow humanize him? Well, I did write beautiful music for him to sing. Uh, beautiful music in that when he addresses Mila, that there, there's an intimacy between the two of them. And the music is really quite beautiful. And also when she sings to him. But then things change rapidly in the script. So I can only linger on those beautiful moments for so long before I have to really do the bump and grind thing or, <laughs> or the shopping blues or one of, the, you know, one of the scenes that we decided together that needed to be shown. You, you do portray her as liking to shop. <laughs> Which is, you know. I, I didn't think that was too controversial. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's try this, Dan. You know, because obviously uh, his supporters 
I don't know if he, we'll get to this in a second, whether he's seen it, whether what he thought yeah. about it and all that. But my hunch is his supporters are going to look at the thing and they're going to say, wait a minute, that's not accurate, and that's right. not accurate, and they're, and they're going to try to poke some holes in it. You, yeah. you did spend a good chunk of time uh, talking about kind of, you know, the failure of the Meech Lake Accord and Charlottetown and kind of no time at all dealing with free trade and the GST, which right, are right. considered two of his signature accomplishments. Yeah. So how come? Uh, just looking for a gag. Just <laughs> looking yeah. for the quick laugh. To be fair, although I was meanest, I think, to Turner. You were. Yeah. You were really nasty to Turner. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I had it's a hard really time. Unfair. I had a really it's hard time unfair. with that. Yeah. I mean, I had, during the time we were working on this, I, I had breakfast with him. I with John had, Turner? I had, happened to have breakfast with him. At a, we're both UBC alumni, okay. and there was a, a power breakfast called, and I sat, you know, two seats away from him. And as I was listening to his voice, I was listening to, in my other ear to what I had done to him. And, well, the words were such that I had to go with the silliness of, of your portrayal of him. I couldn't write, you know, serious, wonderful music when the words are, I had no option. <laughs> I had no option. I think if anybody's going to sue you on this one, it'll be Ed Broadbent. He gets two <laughs> words out of his mouth and you cut him off every time. Yeah, no, I think it's Bob Coates. Oh, Bob, <laughs> well, Bob's well, Bob Coates did go to a German strip bar, though. He did. He's no longer with us, I don't think. So yes, he is. Bob Coates? I what? think so. Robert Coates? Is he still alive? I, well, I don't know. I know nothing about politics. <laughs> I thought, you know what? I need a fact check for everything. This is a good point. Uh, you yeah, know, somebody you know in the control job. room, Google Bob Coates, because I thought for sure he'd passed away. Born 1928. I don't believe he died yet. Okay, well, we'll find because out. Because of the year? <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, Larry, this was supposed to have aired on the CBC. I gather it is not now no, airing on the CBC. No, it wasn't supposed to have aired uh, on the CBC. It was first, it was conceptualized in meetings at CBC about, about what a good cultural special would be for a CBC audience. And, and that's where we're saying, well, let's think about this. We have Wayne and Schuster leading to you know, the Air Force and Codco and this hour is 22 minutes, Rick Mercer, even Kids in the Hall uh, had social satire and, and, uh, it, and Canadians have this kind of political satire thing. This would be a good thing. It would be a good thing for CBC. Is it airing on CBC? Well, I don't know if it would air on CBC. Uh, no, it, it's true that it was developed and then after a certain point, I think they, they kind of wanted to drop out. How come? Well, I think that when you're a federal broadcaster and you're making a film, under a federal conservative party uh, about a federal conservative. In the middle of a federal election? Yeah, well, as it turns out, yes. Hmm. I, I, for me, it wasn't a matter of would they drop out, it was a matter of when would they drop out. So, so <laughs> I and I, w I was very thankful that, that there was some support for a while, and we were able to actually develop the thing through various processes. And Do you know what they just told me in my ear? You're right. Bob Coates, still with us. High five. So he may sue you. Yes, Bob Coates will sue us. <laughs> Uh, was Ed this Broadbent is dead. Ed Broadbent <laughs> is not dead. He is definitely still with us. No, no, check it. That's the control room. <laughs> <laughs> There's Dan. Dan is funny. Dan, did uh, the lawyers did have at this, I presume? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, yeah. Big well, time? Many times. Oh, yes. yeah. yeah? I, they've, they've said it's, you know, it's, all, it's all justifiable. It's all okay? I'd sue. <laughs> what there's only they? one factual. There's only one factual mistake that we made, and and I'm I'm a little nervous about that one. Apparently, when when uh, Maroney met Mila, she did not have bangs, <laughs> and we make a big thing about her bangs. You, you do a whole song about the bangs. There's a whole song, yeah. Yeah. and so I'm and a little nervous. She, and how old was she? She was 18. She was 18. She I know, was I know, but I, I, 17 was way better for the music. Right, meter. it was. And, and I and wrote the music for, for 17. For factual reasons, we had to change right. it to 18. And she That's was horrible. 18. Yeah, she I was know. 18. I know, it's murder. And he was 33. Yeah. And you know what? They're still together and one of the sweetest couples you'd ever I see. Know. Yeah. yeah it's and beautiful. I wrote him a tango when he was, uh, you know, when he was spying her, etc. cetera. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was one of the first tangos I've ever written as well. What, Alex, you know, what, what scene in the movie that survives uh, would have been the most problematic, legally speaking. Oh. Like, I can think of about 15 of them. Just oh, off the is top that my... right? Well, you know, I, I mean, we talked about the Bob Coates one. Yes, I think that probably, that one probably springs to mind to me as well. You well, got, there's no factual problem there. No. Though. You got Mulroney saying that he aspires to be an American. I don't think he ever really said that. Oh, well, then he says Well, Dan. He... <laughs> I just set the, I just wrote the music. Well, I think you just wrote the music. That's right. Okay. Well, uh, yes, I, I definitely thought that that was that was really going way over the line. 
Which is why I then immediately uh, mentioned that it's going way over the line. So. Did you at any point want his cooperation with this project, Mr. Mulroney's? No, that would scare the hell out of me. But what about you? Did we think that that? that we talked a lot about uh, whether it would be a good idea to let him know about it, to maybe even get him to endorse it or mock endorse it. Uh, I didn't like the idea. I, I saw this, you know, you're probably going to ask about keeping it a secret, the fact that we kept this as, as a mm. secret for a long time, but I, I just, just saw it as a, as a gift. A gift to Brian Mulroney. You, to, you know, a lot of you know, he has an ego. You know, to have an opera written by arguably the greatest composer in, in Canada and the funniest librettist. I think the idea, and, and, and uh, I, I think that uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that it's a well, gift. Well, there is no argument. <laughs> no, so I think it's a gift. And you know, you don't like to tell someone about a gift five years before you give it to them. It's 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 a surprise. It's a Christmas. Like, oh, there's the the hobby horse you promised me five years ago. Right. Did, did you keep it a secret? Did you send him a copy of it? We sent him a letter right away. Uh, the last day of shooting said, we've done this thing. Uh, at some point, you may want to see it. Do you know if he has? There's a possibility that he and Mila uh, have seen it, but, but I have no idea if they have. How do you know if they maybe have? You say there's a possibility they have. Well, the, 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 the show has been seen by various broadcasters, and they have connections. Oh, I see. So that yeah. one. It's the kind of thing probably where I wouldn't imagine that he would say that he'd seen it, you know? Like it, right. Yeah. If, he, if he saw it, I think he'd like it. But in some respect, <laughs> well, you, you need to have led a consequential life to be the subject of something like this. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, you are kind of paying tribute to his life or paying homage to his life. Yes. Yes? Fair yeah. to well, say? It Absolutely. was five yeah. years of work. I mean, it was not an insignificant amount of labor and... Um, creativity on our parts. And, and think about it, he's got, a, I mean, in real life he has a very nice voice, but I would argue that the voice we've given him is even nicer. Daniel Okulich, yeah. yes. uh, Rick Miller, who's, who embodies that voice, is an amazing dancer. But, but in a way, you know, it's, 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 it's metaphor. I mean, he, he wins this 211 seat majority. And can you imagine what Brian Mulroney thought when he was in his office for the first time all alone after that majority? In his mind, he was leaping up on his desk and dancing like a rock and roller, I can assure you. <laughs> As you've we, got him in the movie. We just showed right. him doing yeah. that. Well, Don't right. you think? I, I think that ultimately, though, that, that, that I see this as kind of a roast in a way. It's, it's, it's not, uh, I didn't, I, I wasn't feeling mean spirited when I did it. So really, know. absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely. Like it's the kind of thing that, that if, if you were going to get together with and get somebody you knew and mock them, that's the kind of thing you'd do. You'd do so. Okay. Well, let me play devil's advocate here. Okay. You got him swimming in a pool filled with money. Amer 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 American money. Yes. You got him on a beach taking a bag of money from Carl Heinz Schreiber. Yeah. You got him with this chin that is, you know, obviously meant to be way over the top. Yeah. You got him in some scenes that don't reflect on we, him. To be fair, we couldn't afford a chin that would have been life size. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You, I mean, you do portray him in some, shall we call it, less than flattering circumstances. Yes, but that's the kind of thing I do with my friends, and I don't keep friends for very long. <laughs> and the music for the pool scene is very beautiful. The music, yes, it is. It's, it's some of my favorite music. You love your music, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I lived with it for five years. I can, well, you better love it then. You better love it. Now, Larry, is it better for this movie if Brian Mulroney sues you or doesn't sue you? Is it better? For, well, I guess if he had sued, he probably should have done it already. Um, but but um, no, I. I don't even think about him suing anymore. I just I think that this is just part of, of now part part of his legacy. Mm -hmm. he, he can't help it. I mean, it's just it's this fun thing. Like I don't know how many lawsuits there have been for the various um, uh, skits, uh, satirical skits, or the political cartoons of Duncan mm -hmm. McPherson, or right. or did John A. Macdonald sue in in 1870 when there was the Ladies of Belleville, this musical written that was making fun of him to the melodies of Gilbert and Sullivan? I don't think so. Um, okay, one last question yeah. then. What do we got? What do we got? A minute left here. You have chosen kind of to roll this out in a rather unique way. Uh, you know, you're not sort of releasing it on 300 screens across the country and playing it for however long it lasts. It's, that, it's out there for a weekend, right? It's out there on the uh, 16th of April. 
27th. And then the 27th. Right. And, and it's done exactly the way the Metropolitan like the Opera, opera live at yeah. the end, and many of the special events are done. It's being treated as a special event. 72 screens across the country is a fairly large, wide release for a Canadian film, and, and then it happens twice, and then we'll see what happens. There's, there's also uh, DVD and Blu-ray releases, but, but it's the kind of film that could have other lives. Sure. I, we showed it to a, a lot of uh, kids in their 20s who said this should be in every school with an educational package. This is how Canadian history should be taught. Um, and, you know, I, I have a feeling I'll have a bit of a shelf life. Hmm. Well, as I say, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was terrific. Oh, thank, thank you. And I'd love to know what he thought of it. Love to hear some feedback from him. I'm curious. We'll find out. You'll find out. Hopefully, yes. you'll ask him next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, you three, for coming in. Much appreciated. It's my pleasure.